Empires rise and empires fall. They expand and they contract, grow and decay. What explains the rise of an empire? What explains its decline? Are there any regularities in this process of growth and decay? In other words, does history repeat itself? Many philosophers and historians believe so. The founder of French socialism, uh, Saint-Simon, argued, the law of human development reveals two distinct and alternative states of society. One, the organic, in which all human actions are classed and foreseen by a general theory, and the purpose of social activity is clearly defined. The other, the critical, in which all communal action, all coordination, have ceased, and the society is only an agglomeration of separate individuals in conflict with one another. In organic periods, men are busy building. In critical periods, they are busy destroying. Likewise, the German philosopher Oswald Spengler argued that civilizations have two periods. In the first period, the culture is unified into a unique, coherent and artistic form. In the second period, the culture decomposes in division and criticism, which ends in individualism and skepticism. Despite coming from very different political traditions, St. Simone was a socialist while Spengler was a conservative revolutionary, they both associate skepticism with decline. This is because skepticism destroys people's faith in their own culture. But skepticism is not always the cause of decline. Indeed, moral and religious beliefs can and have destroyed civilizations. In his book, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Edward Gibbon argues that Christianity hastened the fall of Rome. To quote him, As the happiness of a future life is the great object of religion, we may hear without surprise or scandal that the introduction of Christianity had some influence on the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. The clergy successfully preached the doctrines of patience, whilst the active virtues of society were discouraged, and the last remains of military spirit were buried in the cloister. A large portion of public and private wealth was consecrated to the specious demands of charity and devotion, and the soldiers' pay was lavished on the useless multitudes of both sexes who could only plead the merits of abstinence and chastity. Whether Edward Gibbon was wrong or not, there can be no doubt that morality and religion can destroy a civilization. Often, a society's most cherished beliefs lead to its collapse. In his book, The Suicide of the West, James Burnham argues that our society's most cherished beliefs are doing just that. He begins the book by making the same observation that I have just made, namely, empires rise and empires fall, they expand and they contract. He claims that Western civilization is in a phase of contraction rather than expansion. At the start of the First World War, the West controlled almost all the world. At the time of Burnham's writing, it was in a stage of very rapid decline. Cairo's ancient citadel barracks, Egyptian troops prepare to take over the historic fortress, which since 1882 has been in the hands of the British Army. Burnham begins his book by observing, the process of shrinking, when it unmistakably sets in, is seldom if ever reversed. Though the rate of erosion may be slow, centuries long, the dissolution of empires and civilizations continues, usually always, until they cease altogether to exist or are reduced to remnants or fossils, isolated from history's mainstream. We are therefore compelled to think, it probably, that the West, in shrinking, is also dying. Why is the West shrinking? Burden makes the point that it is not due to economic resources or military power. At the end of World War II, the West had a monopoly on nuclear weapons and more than half of the world's wealth. So it cannot be the case that the West uh, is contracting due to lack of physical resources or military power. We must, therefore, conclude that the primary causes of the contraction of the West, not the sole causes, but the sufficient and determining causes, have been uh, internal and non-quantitative, involving either structural changes or intellectual, moral and spiritual factors. In other words, the West could have expanded without any real challenge post-World War II, but instead of expanding, it contracted. Burnham therefore claims that the West chose to contract and is therefore in the process of committing suicide. Burnham's book argues that what Americans call liberalism is the ideology of Western suicide. What is liberalism and how has it brought about Western suicide? When Burnham uses the word liberal, he is referring to progressives or leftists rather than classical liberals. Classical liberals tended to be patriotic and nationalistic, 
they believed that one could only be free if they lived in a sovereign and self-governing nation. They were ready to fight and did fight, not merely to defend their own country, but to advance its interests and influence. They did this because they associated individual freedom with national freedom, otherwise known as sovereignty. Writing in 1964, Burnham said, Liberalism has during the past several decades become less patriotic in the old fashioned sense, more pacifist and more internationalist. Everybody knows this. It is shown publicly a thousand times a day. These tendencies are a commonplace of modern argument and rhetoric. Burnham argues that the average liberal of his time feels a little thrill when the flag goes by, is skeptical of tradition, is not grieved when his country loses a colony, war or strategic base, is not grieved by the fact that his nation's own communication industry should on a massive scale print the books, produce the plays and make the movies of those who hate his nation and his civilization and seek, often avowedly, the destruction of both. In short, he is skeptical, if not outright hostile, towards his own nation and civilization. He is committed instead to humanity as a whole, thinking in terms of duty to humankind rather than a duty to the nation. He has faith in humankind and is skeptical towards the nation. This can be contrasted with the conservative, who is more localized in both thinking and sentiment. For him, group membership is not defined by abstract reason, but by shared memory, feeling, custom and religion. Let's return to the question that I originally asked, namely, what explains a civilizational decline? One of the causes identified was destructive skepticism. To quote uh, Saint Simon once again, in organic periods men are busy building, in critical periods they are busy destroying. Our period is largely defined by the destruction of religious and national beliefs. Traditionally, these beliefs regulated and defined all human actions. They provided us with what we might call the reality principle of our culture. They defined who we were, where we stood in the universe, and what the good way of life was. Today, Western liberal governments not only tolerate, but actually subsidize uh, critiques of these ideas. Instead of promoting a commitment to the nation, they promote a commitment to humanity. The problem is, of course, that it is difficult to empathize with all of humanity. Whenever the we becomes too large and abstract, solidarity begins to break down. To quote uh, Nassim Taleb, a country is not a large city, a city is not a large family, and sorry, the world is not a large village. Without shared memory, feeling, custom and religion, group membership becomes something vague and abstract. Society quickly becomes nothing more than a collection of individuals who have very little in common. Burnham argues that liberalism is the philosophy of Western suicide because it destroys group bonds without adequately replacing them. In its attempt to create a universal civilization, it has discouraged parochial divisions, distinctions and discriminations. In so doing, it has also destroyed the common culture that bound us together. It has not, however, been capable of replacing this old bond with a new one. Outside of urban centres, very few people feel like citizens of the world. Instead, they feel like an agglomeration of separate individuals in conflict with one another. This is perhaps most evident in America, which has begun to balkanize and break down. Skepticism towards tradition, whether it be nationalistic or religious, combined with a quixotic belief that people would begin to identify as citizens of the world, helps explain how this balkanization occurred. It also explains how defeats of Western civilization, such as the loss of Algeria and the denigration of national heroes, come to be seen as victories in the eyes of Westerners rather than defeats. In other words, liberalism helps explain how the West has contracted, decayed and declined.